Uh, we are starting session number six in the I Am A Church Member uh, series. This uh, session is called, I Will Treasure Church Membership as a Gift. And we're going to be several different places in the Bible, so we're going to be jumping around a little bit. So session number six, the final session in our I Am A Church Member series, and it's titled, I Will Treasure Church Membership as a Gift. When we began this study, I quoted some statistics of how a survey taken in 2004 to 2010 found that 9 out of 10 churches surveyed were either in decline or not keeping up with their community's growth. It also talked about the percentage of people who claimed to be Christian by generation had continued to go down for probably the last 70 or 80 years. So it doesn't sound like church attendance, church membership is doing all that well, which is why we're looking at the study about why I am a church member. In session number one, we looked at 1 Corinthians 12, where the Apostle Paul compares the church to the human body. And the comparison was, just like the human body is made up of many different parts, the church is made up of many different parts. And Paul talks about all the gifts of the church members and how no church member is non-essential. When we were in the military, I always loved it when we had snow days because they said non-essential personnel didn't have to come in. Well, in the church, there's no such thing as non-essential. Everybody has a gift. Sometimes you need to find that gift. But everyone has a gift, and that gift is intended to build up the church. In session two, we looked at being a unifying church member, and we looked at Ephesians chapter 4, and again, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about how in order to be a unifying church member, we need to have love for all of our fellow members. And we talked about that in relationship to the universal church as well as the local church. In session 3, we were in Philippians, and we again talked about how some people can let their preferences and desires get in the way of unifying the church. <clears throat> how church membership should be about the us and not the me, myself, and I. Session four, we talked about church uh, leadership. We talked about 1 Timothy 3, and we talked about the different qualifications to be a pastor. And in there, we talked about how best to support our pastor. And one of the things that we talked about was continually praying for him and his family as they minister. Then last week, we were in Ephesians again, session 5, and we were talking about the comparison of the church family to the human family and how that's some, there are some correlations. So today, we're going to kind of wrap it up. And really, today's session is almost a summary of the previous five, but it's talking about treating your church membership as a gift, and similar to what Pastor Jim talked about this morning. So since we're talking about gifts, you know me, I always start with a question, so here's your question for the day. What was the most special gift you ever received? Nancy? A dozen of roses from a friend of mine that lives in Arizona. Okay. Roses from a friend. Doug? My salvation. Your salvation. Okay. My baptism. Your baptism? Okay. I just think the gift of Jesus was my greatest gift. Okay. You say marriage. Marriage? Okay. Church family, okay? I have to say my wife. She's <laughs> better. She's sitting next to you. <laughs> Paul, you're very lucky. Yeah. Yes, I am. 
mine was being born to Christian parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Born in the United States. Yeah. Well, I actually went back to when I was a teenager. And some of you may or may not remember these things, but I remember as a young teenager for Christmas one year, I got a remote controlled airplane. Now, you got to remember. This is like in the 1960s. So we're not talking about these things that are radio controlled. We're talking about the remote control that they were uh, flown with wires. I see some of you nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. They were gasoline powered and you had about 10 foot of cord and somebody had to launch the thing, and then you had to turn in a circle, and how you moved your hand made it go up and down. I was real lucky if I got one circle before I could nosedive. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody had to flip that prop, too. Somebody had to go get it and flip the prop, and they had to send it off again. It didn't take off from the ground. Somebody tossed it, and you had to make sure you were level, and then you could go up and down depending on how you moved your hand. Like I say, I got maybe once, maybe sometime I may have made twice, but most of the time I went boing and did a nosedive. But the reason I came up with that is because it took two people to do it. You couldn't do it by yourself. It took two. So that was time that either my dad went out and did it with me or my younger brother went out and did it with me. And we had some quality time, either brother or father-son time, till I got really frustrated and we had to quit. <laughs> but what made the gift special was not the gift, but the time that we spent together playing with that gift. When we started these sessions, back six weeks ago, the first chapter in the little book, the author compares the church to a country club. And he makes the comparison that you go to a country club, and you pay the dues for a country club because you want the perks that the country club can give you. When I joined the Liberty Community Center and we pay our dues, it's because we want to go to the gym and we want to take the classes and that kind of stuff. But when you join a church, <coughs> why? <coughs> why do you join a church? And we kind of looked at why people join a church. <coughs> I can tell you that, and we talked about this before, there's the universal church. I think we mentioned this maybe last week or sometime during our sessions. When you become a Christian, it's absolutely automatic, no option required. You become a member of the universal church. That's every believer from past to present to future of every race, nationality, tribe on earth. Anybody who has professed faith in Jesus Christ is a member of the universal church. No option. Membership in a local church, though, is an option. You don't have to belong to a local church. If you look at the scripture, and we've found this over the last five weeks, and if you've been with the class for any length of time, you think about all the epistles that we have studied over the last two and a half, three years that we've been together. Almost all of them were written to local churches. The church at Philippi, the church at Rome, church at Corinth, church at Ephesus, or they were written to an individual at a local church. Now, they were members of the universal church, but they were also members of a local church. I found it interesting when I was doing some research, according to one commentary, there are over 30 commands given in the epistles that you cannot 
obey if you don't belong to a local church. I'll give you one for instance. Hebrews 10.25 says to not forsake the gathering of yourselves together as some do. And you can't gather together unless you're part of a local church. Amen. There are lots of other commands. Like I said, the commentary that I looked at said there were over 30 commands that you can only be in obedience to if you are a member of a local church. Most of you know that uh, I'm a retired military, which means we moved a lot. I sat down as I was preparing this, and I started counting on my fingers the number of churches and chapels that we belong to in the last 50-plus years that Vivian and I have been married. Came up with over a dozen different churches and chapels that we belong to. Usually a local church, depending on where we were, but overseas a lot of times it was the post-chapel. But the first thing that we would do when we would get into a community within the first couple of weeks is we start visiting churches. So we found one that kind of fit with where we were in our lives. When we had kids, we tried to find ones that fit for children or teens. Once it was just the two of us, we were looking for something more for adults. But we were looking for something that fit why? Very simple reason. We had a ready-made family when we joined a local church. We had people that we knew shared our values. If we had kids, we knew that they shared our commitment to being good parents and to families. But we found a church because it gave us a ready-set family to belong to because usually we were a long way from our biological families so it was important to find a local church for us in today's session we're going to look at four biblical images of the church four pictures that the new testament gives us of what the church should be all about so the first one we're going to look at is in Mark chapter 3. So Mark chapter 3, beginning at verse 31 and going through 35. And the first image that we're going to look at and remember, I said this is kind of a summary of all the things that we've talked about the last five weeks. Image number one is the church is a special gift because it, it is the family of God and true members are children of God. So Mark 3, verses 31 through 35. Angie, would you read those, please? Sure. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whomever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Okay. And the whole month... Verse 31 starts off, then. And anytime you see the word then, that means there's something that's gone before. So if you look up to before, the verses 20 through 30, before we get to this section, you find that the Pharisees are questioning him and are claiming that he is actually the personification of Satan, that he's actually possessed by Satan. And he's talking to them and telling them, a house divided cannot stand. And then we kind of get an interlude here. And he's teaching inside a house. And there's a crowd around him. There's evidently a crowd around the house. And his mother and his brothers, his half-brothers, come to get him. <clears throat> now, why would they be looking for him? 
I think on various reasons. Jesus has been into his ministry for a while. Traveling as a traveling preacher would have been tiring physically. He's being questioned continually by the Pharisees, so emotionally, um, psychically, if you will, he's probably strained and stressed. I've heard some ministers say that the reason his mother and his brothers came was to get him to take him home so he could get some downtime, my words, some time away from the stress. After all, just before this, he's been accused of being possessed by Satan. But Jesus comes out with kind of a culturally strange statement at this point. He's told that his mother, brother, and sisters are outside, and here's his answer. He replied to them, Who are my mother and my brother? The little snide remark would be, Hey, Jesus, they're outside. That's who they are. That's not what he meant. Verse 34, And looking around at those who were seated in a circle around him. Those would have been his disciples seated around him. That was the place you normally found a disciple, was at the foot of the teacher. It would not have been those Pharisees who were accusing him of being possessed by Satan. They would not have been sitting there as learners. But his disciples were sitting around his feet, listening to what he had to say. And looking around at those who were sitting in the circle around him, he said, Here, and I can just, in my mind's eye, I can picture him saying, Here, are my mother and my brothers. Biological family in this time was everything. We've talked about that before. Culturally, biological family was everything to an individual. And here we see Jesus basically saying to his disciples, yes, biological family is important, but your religious family is important too. Whoever does the will of God, in other words, whoever is a believer, is my brother and my mother and my sister. It's not something that you earn. Jesus has said in other places that you don't earn your place into the family of God. When I asked you for what was the most special gift you ever got? There were a lot of you that said salvation or baptism or something related to church membership, to the faith community, your faith family. Being part of a faith community, being part of a spiritual family, being part of God's family is not something that we earn. In fact, if you'll remember our study of the book of Romans, Paul's very emphatic throughout the book that the only way we are justified before God, become part of God's family, is through the grace and gift of God. That's how you become part of the family. John 1, verse 12 and 13 says, but to all who received him, him being Jesus, he gave the right to be the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, you don't become a Christian because your mother was a Christian, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. Belief is not hereditary. Now, Angie, I think you said... You were thankful for your Christian family. Having a Christian family helps because you're exposed to it. But growing up in a Christian family does not make you a Christian. Yeah, but I think it's so important because 
not being exposed to it and just being exposed to the world, oh my gosh, some mm -hmm. people are never exposed to Jesus. It's harder if you're not growing up in a Christian family. Amen. Not impossible, no, but not, hard. No, 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 no. But the fact that you grow up in a Christian family no, does not make not. you part of God's family. No, absolutely not. But does point you in that direction. So first picture, first image we have of the church here is that we are one spiritual family with God at the head and all the believers as members of that family. Doug? And it's not necessarily that you won't rebel and turn away once nope. you grow up, but praise the Lord or hopefully you'll come back <laughs> when you grow up and quit being stupid. We were having a discussion at our house Friday. Our oldest son came down from Cameron. And we were having a discussion about teenagers. He has an 18-year-old. And um, his mother, we were with a neighbor talking, and his mother reminded him of the one time that he got me really mad as a teenager. And... Um, Steve said, you know, I understand that much better now that I have been the father of a teenager. <laughs> yeah, teenagers rebel as part of being a teenager, I think. And sometimes church members rebel and drift away. But they're still part of God's family. Okay, image number two. The church is a special gift because it is the temple of God and God is uniquely with us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Janice, would you read those when you find it? I'll give you a minute. The pages stick together. Yeah, the pages stick together. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 16 starts out, don't you know, and you hear his plural. He's writing to the church at Corinth, not to an individual. He's writing to the church. So don't you know, don't you as a church know that you are God's sanctuary? Now, church in Corinth was made up of Jews and Gentiles, and when he starts talking about God's sanctuary, where were the Jews probably first off think about what image comes to your mind? Uh, if you were a Jew, who would you be thinking if somebody says God's sanctuary? A temple. The temple. Temple in Jerusalem. That would be the thing that they would think about. The ornate building. If they were Gentiles, if they were pagans, they may have been thinking about some of the Greek or Roman gods and goddesses' temples. They would be thinking about a building. Don't you know that you are God's sanctuary? We kind of think building when we hear that. But you got to remember, church back then didn't have a building. There wasn't a First Baptist Church of Corinth, or a community church of Corinth. It's a, there wasn't denominations. Let's just say community church of Corinth. They met in people's homes, in little groups. And that the Spirit of God lives in you. Well, for the Jews, where did the Spirit of God live? Bev, you said it a minute ago for one. Tabernacle. Tabernacle to begin with. And then when they built the temple, God's presence was in the temple. But now, Paul is saying, you don't have a building. God's church is the universal church. It's the believer's and God lives in you. 
And then verse 17 is given theologians' fits. If anyone ruins God's sanctuary, God will ruin him, for God's sanctuary is holy, and that is what you are. Paul doesn't say a word about what he means by ruin. Most of the commentaries that I looked at simply says that what Paul is saying here is that those who try to destroy the church of God will eventually face his judgment. Why? Because God is holy, and if we are God's sanctuary, if God dwells in us, then that makes us holy as well. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Far from it. But what it means is, God the Holy Spirit indwells believers and connects them to other believers and to God. So, the church is God's temple. And God dwells in His temple and therefore God dwells in us. Image number three. The church is a special gift because it is the body of Christ and to be part of that makes each member significant and included in the eternal purposes of God. Remember back in session one, we looked at the 1 Corinthians 12 where he lists out all of the different gifts of the Spirit. The church, like a human body, has many parts and many members, and none are not essential. We all have a gift to contribute. Maybe we don't know what that gift is. Well, I got good news for you. If you don't know what your gift is, if you ever read the bulletin, I'm a bulletin reader. On the back of the bulletin, it says that on Wednesday, October the 26th, Wednesday night, there's going to be a spiritual gifts workshop to help you to identify what your spiritual gift is. Is that what we're doing? Excuse me? Is that what we're doing in our group? We're going to continue on with ours. This is an additional thing. You know, you can go to either one. So if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, here's a chance to find out. I'm willing to bet most of you in here have taken spiritual gift inventories before. Yeah, we did it. I think we did it. I think I've taken it three or four times. You know, we've done them a lot. And I always end up with the same one, which is really good. It means I've, I've kind of got the right one. Mine always seem to be whatever the Lord, I mean, whatever the church needs. Mm -hmm. so. so in First Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at a, a different verse that kind of talks about the idea of gifts. So First Peter chapter 4. And verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, John Rickliffe, would you read that one? <clears throat> Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Okay. Holman version says, Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God kind of ties back into that 1 Corinthians 12. And it kind of ties in to what Pastor Jim said this morning, if you caught it at the end. He was talking about being good stewards and good managers of the gifts that we have for the church. A steward or a manager was responsible for the household and was responsible for making sure the household ran properly and um, things were properly expensed. Apostle Peter here is kind of saying, guys, you don't really have anything that's yours. What you have is what God has lent you for a amount of time. It's a loan. You're managing it. You're steward of it. And as 
some of the parables in the Gospels say, someday you're going to be asked to give an accounting of how you have managed your gifts. And are you going to be proud of how you manage your gifts? Those special abilities, those gifts are given so that the church can be built up. Are you using it to build up the church? Because they were given to you by God for that purpose. The last image we're going to look at is in Revelations. Revelations 19. I told you we are going to be all around the place today. Revelations 19, verses 6 to 9. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Bev, would you read those when you find them? Sure. One more page. One more page. Okay. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and, a loud, and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper, invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Okay. So the last image of the church is the church is a special gift because it is the bride of Christ and helps us foresee our future. In chapter 19 of Revelation, the angel has taken the Apostle John and showed him an awful lot of things. Some very terrible things. And now he's showing him kind of the good thing that's going to be at the end. Again, it starts off then in the Holman, which means think about everything that's gone before. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumble of loud thunder. Commentary says this is the voices of all the believers who are gathered together. Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, has begun his reign. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself. She was permitted to wear fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. So that's the wedding of the church. That is... The wedding of the church to the bridegroom of Christ. Now, authors, Bible commentaries, Bible scholars argue about where the wedding feast takes place. We're not going to get into that, okay? Depending on your premillennial, postmillennium, panmillennium, I don't know. Some say it happens in heaven. Some say it happens on earth. Don't make a difference. Well, I'll ask God about that later. Wouldn't it be after the rapture? Depends on which way you go. Oh, okay. Okay. I like I said, we're not going to get into that because it depends on what your view is on when the mm -hmm. rapture occurs and what okay. when the tri <laughs> tribulation is and so forth. So whatever. What's important is that this is the point at which the church is united with its head, with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and I found it interesting again, reading through the commentary, that in this culture, and I think in this culture still today in the Middle East, when a bridegroom prepares to take a bride, he pays a dowry, then takes his bride to his father's house, and it's there that the marriage takes place. Well, think about it. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus paid a price for his bride. That price was his death on the cross. That allowed us church members to be part of 
that universal church, part of that bride of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. So he has paid the price. And someday, with however P or post millennial you might get, he is coming to take his bride to heaven, where he will take it to his father's house. Again, remember in the Gospels he talks about in my father's house there are many mansions. So he's coming. He's paid the price. He has the bride. And someday he's going to take himself, his bride, to heaven. And notice that she is going to be permitted to wear fine linen, bright and pure. The church will be righteous when he takes her to heaven. Not because of anything that we've done. Again, the end of verse 8 says, The linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. It's not because we're righteous. It's because because of his sacrifice, we have been made righteous before God, and he can take us to his Father's house because we're now justified before him. Go ahead. If we, if we go to heaven, and as it says, as, we're, as we go up to heaven, no, nothing that goes into heaven can be unrighteous. Unrighteous. Yeah. yeah. So we have to be righteous. You have to be righteous. But again, it, it, it's it, not because of something we did. No, absolutely not. It's because of something else we did. Exactly. And here's a bit of trivia I had never thought about. I don't know how many of you have ever studied Revelation before, for Marriage Feast of the Lamb. I've never heard this before. Till I read this in the commentary. He's taking his bride to the marriage feast. And the bride is the church. Well, brides do not have to be invited to their marriage feast. So who are the invited guests that are coming? I like the answer I got out of the commentary. It's all those who were righteous before God prior to Jesus' coming. Oh, okay. So think Abraham, Isaac, uh -huh. Jacob, Noah, all of the Old Testament okay. patriarchs who never knew Christ, therefore never believed on Christ per se, but they believed God. And if you remember... In a number of places it says it was applied to them for righteousness sake because they believe God. That's who was invited. All those ones who are not part of the church, people who believe in Jesus Christ, but were believers in God. Never thought about that one before. A bit of trivia you can impress your friends with maybe. But think about that one for a while. As we've gone through the last six weeks, we've tried to examine a number of different comparisons of the church with different things, family, body, organizations, so forth. What it really comes down to is we want the church to be healthy, unified, praying, serving, doing all the things that we have been called to do. Great Commission teaching them to observe all things, making disciples. We have a mission. Amen. In the military, you are giving a mission. You are told, go take that hill. Christ called, told his disciples, go take that world. Whether it's in our individual lives or in our corporate lives, we are members of the universal church. We are members of the local church. But more importantly, we are members of God's church. And we should show to others what effect that has on our lives. They should be able to see Jesus in us. And I think there's no greater gift that we can have as church members than to be members of a church that strives to show 
that Jesus is in our midst. And with that, we'll close. Any comments? Anything else you'd like to add before we close this morning? Okay, next week we are in Hosea. Uh, the Bible lessons that we have skipped because of the study, they're online if you want to catch up with them. And again, thanks to Charlie, he's teaching next week, and then you'll get me back in two weeks. Okay, uh, John Dameron, would you close this in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for my church family and what it means to me and the lessons I've received, not only from you, but from the members of this church brothers and sisters. I give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.